Are you curious about the world of music supervision? Maybe you're looking for a career change and you think being a music supervisor might be the way to go. Then listen up because Cassandra and I are talking to music supervisor John Pashada, and he's going to talk to us about the Sync School, where you can learn all about the ins and outs of being a music supervisor and see if it's right for you. So we are here back again, me, Janae Giddens, and I'm with my wonderful music attorney, Cassandra Spangler, as usual. Hey, Cassandra. Hi, Janae. We are here today, not alone. We have a guest today. Our guest is John Piscata. Hello. Yay. And I said it wrong, didn't I? It's Piscata. It's Piscata. That was pretty close, yeah, actually. So- yeah. yeah. Thanks for inviting me on today. <laughs> I know your name, so I don't understand why I said it wrong, but... It's a tricky one. When you got that many vowels, <laughs> it's tricky. John, thank you so much for agreeing to come on and speak with us. You have so much going on. Glad to be here. We have we have fun and we, uh, we move. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't why don't actually why don't I I say how I even sort of met you right because right so far it's kind of virtual but um, through the sync I, school yeah exactly I right. went to the sync school and yes. I found it through the help desk which Lexi was sort of hosting and you yeah. and her were having conversations about the sync school I was completely intrigued by it. Mm, um, good. Because I work with music supervisors um, as as a musician trying to get my songs synced and never really thought about the fact that, hey, that being a music supervisor is actually a thing. Right. So I wanted to learn more about music supervision on the supervisor side also just to help yeah. figure out, okay, so what is it they're looking for? What do they want? Yeah. How can I serve them? So I joined the sync yes. school. Yeah. And it was awesome, by the way. We had a good time. I mean, it's it's five days, but it is, it's packed. We really want the students in the sync school to just get ten times, you know, their investment in the sync school, and it's a, uh, it's kind of important because there's so many new projects out there. I mean, we get calls every day saying, "Hey, I need help managing music for my film or my advertisement or YouTube video," and you know, we can't help all of them. So we really kind of our mission at the sync school is to train up the next generation of supervisors who can handle projects. Um, and unfortunately there's really no, like you can't really study a book on this. You kind of have to do it and fail and fumble. And, um, uh, you know, we, for like the first 17 projects we did were just in the nineties we're just, we, we failed our way into this. You know, we, we figured it out by failing. So now it's like, you know, we think of it as, you know, our hindsight is the next generation's foresight. And if we can, you know, save them that pain, you know, and give them some real sound structural ways to think about music supervi- supervision, you know, it, it's, uh, it's going to help them a lot. So, so we have a great time. We pack a lot into it and we work on real projects. Right. And like I said, it was an amazing five days. It was packed. Yeah. I was exhausted. Um, <laughs> but we did have a lot of fun. The projects were a lot of fun. Um, so that sure. that was awesome. But you know something? We should probably back yeah. up a little bit because yeah. who the heck are you, Mr. John Pashada? I'm a kid from Texas. I grew up, you know, playing guitar in bands in the 80s and, um, you know, got my foot in the door in a recording studio in Texas and swept out the studio and got to use the studio at night when no one was there. Cool. Um, just really in love with music. Grew up, you know, Steve Ray Vaughan, Van Halen, Pat Metheny. Those were kind of my guys. And, um, you know, I was fortunate to, to make a move to Nashville in the early nineties and, um, went to Belmont university. Um, when Brad Paisley was there and Frank Rogers and Jace Everett was there wow. and, you know, I just wanted to, I, I wanted to be in music and I thought that was like guitar guy. And then 
that turned in, you know, I toured for a couple of years, toured the world and had a, had a great time. You know, when you're 21 and you, you get to go to Monaco for two weeks, that's pretty cool. So, right. you know, lived in a bus, did that for a couple of years. And I guess I, I guess I get bored really easy. And like, after I did that, I was like, okay, been there, done that. I don't want to be tour- touring my whole life. It's fun for a couple of years, but you know, I felt like I wanted to be more creative than just two hours a night, you know? So you're sitting around the hotel or traveling or flying 22 hours out of the day. And then you go on at night. Mm-hmm. And again, it was fun, super grateful. That was a great time in my life, but I felt like I wasn't using all of really what I could do. So, um, that turned into a writer publishing deal at Sony tree with a guy named Randy Cox. And he was a mentor of mine and, and, you know, gave me a lot of rope to, you know, write, write the song, produce the song, mix the song, turn in the invoice for the song. And, uh, this was, you know, right when Garth was taken off in kind of the 94, 95. And, um, and so, you know, I wrote for mm-hmm. three or four years for Randy. And um, again, I mean, it, you, you just learn a lot by trying things. And I found out that, you know, I'm not great at hitting a moving target. There are some songwriters who can write these songs that are just, you know, undeniable, iconic, universal songs. And I wasn't that. I could, pr- I can write and produce and arrange, but that killer songwriter instinct wasn't evident there. You know, it was fun. I loved it. Learned a ton. But, um, so, so that writing for Sony then turned into a production company. So instead of just writing the single song, we were then, you know, every three months we were producing a different record. So, you know, write the songs for the record, go in and cut the tracks, overdub the tracks, vocals, editing, mixing, mastering, you know, every three months, you know, kind of doing that pattern. And that kind of grew a different muscle because now we're like, okay, we just can't use good songs. We really need to fight for great songs. So we learned a ton over the 10 years of producing records. And it was about that time that we started doing sync licensing. And I was like, oh, wow, you mean that that song we did three years ago, someone wants to pay us 2000 bucks to use it in Dawson's Creek. Mm -hmm. I was just like, Whoa, that's, that's cool. We get, we get paid twice. So, so that was kind of a light bulb moment. And, um, and then we did a joint venture with Garth Brooks company, won some awards, had a song of the year nomination and a video of the year nomination. And, uh, so, you know, that, that kind of, turned into Jetpack Artist Ventures, which is the company I help lead now and for the last 18 years. Um, It's a future-facing media company. We have an independent record label. We have the Sync Center, which does supervision and licensing. We have Hacking Music, which is our training program. And, you know, that, that keeps us busy. It keeps us busy. You know, we we're big believers in helping the next generation of artists and that kind of gets us to hacking music in the sync school. It's, you know, it's, there's not a, how do I say this? There's, there's a lot of really overpriced education, colleges, universities that are trending 15 years late. So when I was teaching at at Belmont, you know, they were, they wanted me to use this book, that was just kind of behind the times. And I was like, guys, you know, I'm not really comfortable using this because it's not where the world is today. So that really was the impetus for us to write hacking music, which is a book that we, we wrote and we launched it at Harvard university of all places. Um, which is kind of mind boggling. So we really take a honest, you know, we, we, we call it, no BS, real world, and 100% actionable. So the stuff that we train our students in is the stuff we do every day in our businesses. 
it's not theory. It's not kind of overly clever stuff. It's like, this is how you do stuff. This, this is how you get hired. This is how you manage projects. This is how you onboard customers. This is how you do e-commerce, you know, the whole mm-hmm. thing. So, um, so yeah, it's, 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 um, it's not just cause somebody's clever. It's because we're, we've actually been fortunate to work on real things. And, you know, back in the nineties, they used to do these developmental deals where, you know, they'll develop you as an artist or take some chances on you as a writer. And I was very fortunate to, to be in that space in the early nineties, but now those developmental deals are gone. So there's this big chasm of, you know, kind of these super talented Mm -hmm. 22 year old kids. And there's no way for them to like convert that into a career. You know, it used to be in the nineties, you could do that. People would take a chance they'd give a talented writer a, a chance. Now it's like, that's totally gone. So you've got this chasm there and I'm going like, well, how do we, how do we replace the artists we've lost with the next generation right. of healthier, more profitable artists? Same with supervisors. How, how do you get from, Hey, I love music to, Hey, I'm working on projects. That's a big chasm. Um, so, so that's kind of where we focus. We set aside some hours each week to train artists. We don't call it coaching. We don't call it consulting. We, we call it training for a reason. Because we're we're training people to take our place, right? And and right. really allow our hindsight to be their foresight. We don't want them to make all the mistakes on their own. And that you know that's a lot of what like Cassandra and I do when we have these discussions. We're trying to reach out to the independent, mostly independent artists, which most people are independent artists at this point in time. Because as you said. Yeah. The model has changed. Totally. The whole business yeah. has changed. So that's that's a lot of what we talk about um, in just trying to get the basics yeah. for the artist to understand. You, it's a business and you have to treat it like a business. And here are the things nice. you have to do to at least get that part under control. Um, and Cassandra actually has a, a background in music, too, because she's a drummer. Right. Um, <laughs> So she totally, totally gets this part of why I love Cassandra. She really gets it from all perspectives. Yeah. yeah. And you're exactly right, Janae. It's like there, there used to be this chasm where I'm a indie artist or I'm a label artist. And now it's like, everybody is an indie artist. Tim McGraw is an indie artist. Taylor Swift is indie. She may be in a joint venture venture with Universal. Tim McGraw may be in a joint venture with Big Machine. At the end of the day, he's an independent artist, right? He owns his assets. Right. He's in charge of his career. He's not entering into another Curb Records 20 record deal. He's learned his mistakes. So, so yeah, everybody, every, it's, it's very much a, a joint venture world, you know, and, and I think as artists begin to think of themselves as joint venturable, are they creating something that people want to be in business with? You know, it's not just talent. It's actually your platform. It's actually your, your infrastructure. It's actually your back office. It's actually your e-commerce. All that stuff makes people want to go, okay, wow, this guy, this girl's a real business. You know, there, this is somebody I'm interested in joint venturing with in some capacity. Um, so that's really the new, the, the days of, of getting signed to a label you know, it's, it's just so far beyond us, behind us that, uh, you know, healthy artists really think about how do I build something real? How do, how do I build a platform under my music in a way that it really strengthens support and supports and sells the music and experiences that artists create. And, and, you know, when, when I asked you to come on, I really was super focused, I think on, uh, the sync school because I, I did go through that program. Um, and I was thinking, well, you know what musicians, again, they have an ear, right. Mm -hmm. And they are probably, most of them are probably pretty good at saying, oh, wow, this would be great in this or that, or this scene and all that. Um, so I was thinking this is another way for musicians to maybe have another career on top of being a musician. 
However, all of your other stuff that you offer is also super helpful for musicians. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's artists are at different places in their career, right? So, um, so we've done some work for Toto, obviously at a very different place in their career. Um, as well as developing artists. You know, we think of artists in three tiers or three gears. There's developing artists down at the bottom of the pyramid, deploying artists in the middle, and dominating artists at the top. The top artists are the thoroughbreds, right? And they have different needs and different desires and different pain points. Um, you know, they're the thoroughbreds. They're the Taylor Swifts. They're the Coheed and Cambrias. They're the Tim McGraws. Um, but our mission is really to kind of you know, we, we look at Whitney Houston, Michael Jackson, Waylon Jennings, all the artists we've lost. It's like the industry really fails at replacing those artists, right? So that's kind of our mission is, is to build the next generation of headliner level artists and do it in a way that they're more creative, more profitable, more healthy. You know, in the past, artists have been really kind of What's the best way to say it? You know, they've kind of been pat on the head and say, okay, you just be the artist and you go over there and do cocaine, do stupid stuff and be the art, be right, write music and be that. And it's like, mm -hmm. that's really a debilitating approach to artists. Like you're, you're, you're setting them up to implode. So, you know, now it's different. You know, artists have to be healthy. You know, artists have right. to think about their back office. They, how, how do you. How do you write better songs you know, it, when you're busier than ever? Um, right. Those kind of things, you know, matter for, for headliner level artists. It's not just about the creative side. It's, it's really about the support mechanisms underneath their creativity. Right, right. And, and if you can't do something, you have to learn how to find the person that is going to be your partner. Yeah. <laughs> not tell you what to do, but be your partner. Yeah. Yeah. And and more often than not, artists are going to be the first person to fill a gap. So, you know, they, they may not be their e-commerce person for 10 or 15 years, but they're probably their first e-commerce person for the first 18 months or two years. Mm -hmm. Right. And then they've kind of learned enough to know who to hire and, and how to hand that off and delegate that to somebody who's the right person or the right partner. So, um, yeah, I mean, artists aren't the long-term person, but they're usually the first person that has to figure something out. Right. Right. Whether it's newsletters or fulfillment and shipping, all that stuff. Exactly. But again, it's like a business. Like you, you, you do that in your garage first and, and then you earn the right to kind of like delegate it out to somebody else. Right. So can you talk to us about what is a music supervisor? What what exactly yeah. do they do? Because I don't think that everybody really knows. Sure. Yeah, there's a lot of mythology and magical thinking around this. Music supervision is, at the end of the day, it's about managing music for media. Whether you're choosing songs, whether you're negotiating songs, whether you're clearing songs, uh, budgeting songs for a project, you're managing all the music swim lanes for that film or that advertisement. And you're brought onto a project to fix a very specific problem. You know, the filmmaker is the creative genius, right? They're making the, they're making their film and they're trying to get it into the world. And so when a supervisor comes on, they're there to handle anything that touches music. And that means budgeting. That means negotiations. That means music replacement. Anything in that music soup is the supervisor's responsibility. It seems to me that it, you just kind of fall into this job. Um, <laughs> you maybe know somebody that needs something, and the next thing you know, you're working on a project, and then you kind of yeah. just build from there, which is what you're trying to help shift and, and give people a clearer path with the sync school, correct? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's some essential basics that you don't want to go without. Um, you have to kind of understand how music works in, in master side and publishing side, who the stakeholders are, 
in the music food chain, um, why certain catalogs are super valuable and why other catalogs are very affordable, right? So you're navigating like super songs. This week we were working on um, Justin Timberlake, The Carpenters, and Outcast. Okay. Super songs, Mm -hmm. classic songs, expensive songs. And a lot of times filmmakers fall in love with those songs, right? They're like, oh, I want to use that Carpenter song or that Outcast song. And then they see the price tag of that and they go, okay, well, that's not going to happen or that's cost prohibitive. So the music supervisor is responsible for replacing that music. So yeah, you really have to kind of think about solutions and understand how filmmakers think Mm -hmm. and how they work and what some of their gaps are. So that's a big, that's a big part of it is just kind of understanding your filmmaker and seeing around the corners for them. And actually, just in case anybody from what I said thought, okay, you get a scene and somebody says, find me some music, and you just find it and it all magically comes together. Um, the not so sexy side is all the other work that goes into it. Yeah. There's a lot of work. <laughs> and you yeah. do have to know your stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you have to understand how to negotiate and how to communicate with clarity. So we have a 20 questions document that we go through on one of the days in sync school that basically for each use, it has all the essential deal points for that use. So it, what it does is it gets everybody on the same page. It gets the filmmaker on the same page. It gets the supervisor on the same page. It gets the rights holder, it gets the publishers, everybody who's in that, the stakeholder food chain knows exactly what the heck we're talking about. Like we've eliminated all the variables. It's stuff like that, you know, that, that isn't necessarily sexy or creative, but it allows us to move fast. Stakeholders really kind of breathe a sigh of relief. They're going, oh, great. I don't have to tell somebody how to do their job somebody knows everything I need. So we're helping them do their job, basically. Right. Cassandra. Yes. Any questions so far? I do. Yeah, John, you mentioned at the beginning um, that you wanted other people to be able to learn from your mistakes. Could you tell us maybe about a mistake that you made early on that you wish you hadn't or that you learned from? Yeah. Good question. So... I'm a big believer in not being too precious about your music. Um, One of the first projects we worked on was a Dawson's Creek project. And a good friend of ours, John McCullough, was the supervisor on that. And at the time, we were just in the studio. Like, we wanted to be creative. We just wanted to be in there. And, you know, so when he first reached out to us, we were very precious. I think they were, they were replacing, um, Britney Spears t- level songs with independent artist stuff. Um, this was like in the early, early, early days of streaming coming out of DVDs. What John had to do was replace and resync all the music in Dawson's Creek for streaming because streaming didn't exist. Oh, wow. Um, so they had to go back to Britney Spears and say, Oh, Britney, we want that song that we used 10 years ago. That's now a classic. Oh, would you mind? signing it for the same amount. Um, and of course she said no. So they had to replace the music. Um, and what we did, the first three or four projects we worked on, we were just so overly precious about our music. We were like, Oh, that's going to be a $8,000 use. We're going to hold out for $8,000. And and we had a number of projects go away just because we were overpricing our stuff. And they're like, well, you're not going to get $8,000 for, the song you recorded last year because it, it's not that level of a song. Um, mm-hmm. And what John explained to us is, is that, look, you know, everybody on this project is getting what's called uh, most favored nations. It was like $2,000 and that's it. You either take it or you leave it. Um, and he really took a sign and said, okay, guys, don't get all stirred up and, and overprice your stuff. You just either say yes or no. And that really helped kind of clarify things for us because we were just thinking, oh, we're going to go. We're going to do $10,000 for this. 
you know, because we're replacing Britney Spears, it's got to be worth $10,000. And it, it really, we had a number of deals go away because we were just overly precious about our catalog. So that, that's, that's something that, you know, we tell young writers and young producers, like just do projects, do it for free, do it for 500 bucks, get something into the world. You know, don't, don't say no, don't yeah. say, you know, uh, let's ne- over negotiate. A lot of artists say, well, I'm going to just, I've heard about negotiations, so I'm just going to be real aggressive with negotiations. And the, and the opposite is true. It's like, just yeah. make it simple. It's like, yeah, let's do it. 500 bucks. I'm in. You know, supervisors appreciate that. So those are a couple of the the things that uh, we kind of fumbled our way into. And I would I would say too. I mean, like like for eighteen months, a, a friend of ours at BMI kept calling saying, "Hey, John, we have all these people that need help supervising their projects. BMI is under what's called a consent decree, which means they can only do performance royalties and not sync licensing and for years, we, we just said, no, we don't want to do that. We just want to be in the studio making the record. And after about 18 months of that, of him calling every couple of weeks, we were like, well, let's just talk to these people and listen to what they're saying and see if we can help them. And these were people who were, you know, advertisers, filmmakers, directors, Showtime, Microsoft, you know, there were larger companies and smaller companies. And these are all people that were like, they, they weren't trying to break the law. They were just trying to figure this nest out. They didn't know who to talk to. They'd never done this before. Um, and so we started really listening to the market and listening to their pain points. And, and then we took on some projects to begin with. And, uh, you know, that, that kind of started up the sync center for us. We, we didn't want to do it for years. And then we started listening to him and heard their pain points. It goes, well, yeah, I think we know how to, I think we can help you. Right. And the only reason you were able to help is because you know the back end stuff. You know how it all works. Yeah. And at the time we just figured it out. Like we know, okay, let's talk to Sony and let's talk to the publisher and get a yes. And so it took us some time to figure out our process, but you know, we're pretty tenacious and we're, you know, we, we have a lot of friends that helped us at Sony and Universal who are executives there. And so then you decided to do the sync school after that? Yeah. I mean, we've been supervising music for a number you know, 15 years now. And, you know, there's just more and more projects happening in the world. More and more music is being used in more and more places. And, you know, the, the options are, you know, either hire a lawyer for $900 an hour or try to find a supervisor who's done this 30 or 40 times. And, and those junior supervisors are just, they're not out there. You know, there's a lot of passionate people, but there's not those supervisors who, who can kind of take on a project or, or we can give a project to and know in confidence that they're going to land on their feet. So that's part of why we, we started the sync school is just like training supervisors in the blocking and tackling how music works, how to replace music, how to negotiate, how to get hired, how to understand a deal, you know, deal review. The music part of it is, is pretty, you know, people have the passion part of it, but they don't have the competence part of it. So what we're focused on is building the competence part. People are passionate about music all day long, but that doesn't get you hired. Right. And I know in the course, the project that we worked on, um, and it was a small group of us and they were, it was a great group. Um, but it was so interesting to see how we all came, we all came to the, to the final project with completely different ideas, which was wonderful. Like it it was absolutely amazing, uh, to see that happen. And, 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 Directors need options, right? It's you you don't just give them a silver bullet and one and done and that's it's great. We're we're moving on. You need to be able to bring them, okay, here's half a dozen ideas. Some are pretty down the middle, some are kind of left of center, but let's listen to them and, and see which one, you know, connects with the director and the producer. 
Right. Which, which a lot of times depends on what kind of mood they're going for, because I mean, as, as I learned, you could put one piece of music in a scene and then change it out completely. And the whole yeah. mood of the scene changes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and filmmakers kind of box themselves in like they, they will either have shot something that's too conservative or too silly or too whatever. And they need the music to balance it back mm. out. Like if, if, if it's too silly, they want something a little more serious to, to balance the scene. And the music kind of is that balancing agent more often than not. So who are you looking for to sign up for the sync school? I mean, who, what would you, your perfect candidate be? Yeah. I, I would say it's the person who's worked on some projects and imploded, you know, they've, they've tried to take on some things. They're passionate about it. They know they want to go in this direction. Um, and they're, and they're ready to kind of build that, so that foundation under what they, what they do. Okay. You know, it's, it's the, it's the person who has the passion and now needs the competence. You know what I mean? Well, yeah, I, I do. I'm just wondering how a person uh, without having the experience would, would know that except so again, I'm I'm in a, yeah. a program where I'm actually pitching music to supervisors, and some of mm-hmm. my fellow musicians have actually jumped over to music supervision. Um, yeah, because they they loved that process that we went through of vetting each other's music, you know. Yeah, which is a big part of it. Yeah, I mean that's what that's what what we did in the '90s. I mean, we spent the decade in the studio writing, producing, recording music. And then in listening to the market, we're like, you know, I think we can help these people. Um, and then that started the sync center. So yeah, I mean, it's totally, I mean, you're going to be creative. You need to use that right side of your brain, but you also need to have the left side of your brain. So it's very much whole brain project management, you know? Right. And, and the other thing that I feel like I learned was you, you really actually have to be open to all kinds of music. You can't be yeah. like, I'm the expert at rock and roll and that's all I'm going to yeah. deal with because <laughs> it doesn't work that yeah. way. Yeah. hundred percent. I mean, you're there to serve the filmmaker, serve the, the advertising executive. So, you know, they have some ideas of what they think might work, but you're there to kind of finesse that and to wrestle that down to reality. Um, so yeah, I mean, you're working on, we're, we're working on half a dozen projects right now. And, uh, I mean, they're, they're all over the map and, and you know what, that's kind of a beautiful thing because you, you're not just living in EDM mm-hmm. or you're not living, just li- living in the blues. Like you're three or four times a year, you're, you're working here. You're three or four times a year. You're over here. It's, it's really all over the place musically. And that's, we love that. Right. We love that. So how can people learn more about the sync school specifically um, mm-hmm. and 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 get a feel for whether or not it's something that they might want to try? It's, it's only a, a five day commitment, although it is an intense yeah. five days. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's five days. And then, and then we have a community of supervisors that meet month, month after month. But this is a great way just to, you know, see if this is something you're interested in. It's, it's only a five day commitment. Um, um, so yeah, they can go to hacking dash music.com and there's a bunch of information there. They can also go to our YouTube channel at the sync center.com. Uh, like you said, there's a, a bunch of videos, um, that Lexi and I did on the help desk, which is really just a conversation around the calls that we get every day and, and the questions we get and answering them in a real kind of open real world conversation, Mm -hmm. you know? Yes. Um, So those would be the two places hacking dash music.com and uh, the YouTube channel at uh, for the sync center. Right. And I, I will of course put that in the notes um, for sure with links. Um, And again, you know, shout out to Lexi too, um, because I, that's actually how, like I said, I found you because, because right, of Lexi. Right. Um, she's just such a dynamic yeah. young woman. Yeah, she's great. She's great. And she, you know, we've had 
Lexi has has uh, been hired at ESPN, and we've had a couple of other students who have taken what they've learned at the Sink School and turned that into full time opportunities. And that's something that's pretty pretty exciting. As we've had a couple networks reach out to us, and you know they're looking for people who are again competence. Mm-hmm. Like they get passion every day of the week, but the, the thing that they they communicated to us is we just need people who understand the process, right? So they can train them on their internal process specifics there, but they just need somebody who knows the blocking and tackling of music licensing, and and so we're having some conversations with some networks on some certificates for the sync school that can kind of show them, Hey, these 30 young supervisors are vetted, trained. They've worked on a number of projects. Mm -hmm. They're ready for their first, you know, they're ready to go to ESPN. They're ready to go to Roku. They're ready to go to Netflix. So that's something that we're going to be uh, talking a bit about going forward. Great. Excellent. And we'll, we'll be talking to Lexi actually as well. So good, um, good. because I definitely wanted to hear her perspective on the sync school, which I know is, is, is awesome. She's learned so much and it's been a pleasure to see her actually um, grow and, and learn all of this, this stuff in what seems to me is a short amount of time. Um, but she really is a go-getter. Yeah. Yeah. She's great. Lexi's great. And, and, you know, that's the thing is like, you want to work on real projects. Yeah. Um, there's, there's a lot of kind of pitching, pitch to supervisors and listening sessions. Mm-hmm. And there's nothing wrong with that. But there's a lot of these music briefs that people are pitching out aren't really real music briefs. And we're going to be talking about that more going forward. But uh, it's, it's a little bit misleading for producers to get a brief that's six months six months old Mm. and already filled already done. But people, you know, in the pitch paid to pitch world, you know, are still pitching this project from last year that's been done for nine months. And so that's kind of heartbreaking to see younger producers not knowing what, you know, they don't know what they don't know. So they're just like, Oh, this is a real pitch. This is how people do it. And, you know, I'd say at least 80% of the, the briefs that are out there are, not real briefs. So we wanted to handle it from the buy side, the supervisor side. So that's kind of what the, the sync school is about. And that's what the supervisor sync community is about as well. So we have a great time. Right. Right. And that is, that's a great point. Um, all the supervisors I've ever met (laughs) are like, yeah, we, we don't actually put them out into the world like that for the whole world to just answer because they're already, and you included, obviously so busy. You get pitched, I'm sure a hundred times a day for stuff that people don't even know what they're pitching to. So Mm -hmm. (laughs) just listen to this. This is going to be great for anything you're working on. And that's just not true. Yeah. Yeah. And we, and we focus on relationships rather than transactions. Yes. You know, so when, when you build a relationship, People want to work with people they like. So if I say, hey, Janae, you know, I like you. You know, I, I'm six months from now, I'm working on a thing. Janae, here's this. Do you have anything that could work for this? Mm-hmm. And and people miss that. It's like humans want to work with humans. Right. And I think now that we're distributed and all on Zoom now, it's even more pronounced. It's like good things happen face to face. So whenever break bread together, you're immediately connected 50 times more than if you just met on Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn, you know? Right. And that's the way supervisors are. It's like, you know, if you build relationships with supervisors, that's the super skill. And it's not just, oh, check out my SoundCloud link. You know, it's like, nah, pass. (laughs) Right. Do you know how much music I have to listen to? (laughs) I don't need right. one more song, right? That I, you know, I, I just don't even have a connection to. So, right. Yes. And again, that's what all the supervisors I deal with are say, say the same exact thing, the same exact yeah. thing. So, yep. And I think you get that, Janae. I mean, I think that's something that not only during the sync school, you've sharpened that idea, but it's like you just on your, on your the YouTube channel, you can tell that you're just, you're a real person. 
you happen to be on YouTube, but you're not, you know, like a digital only person. You're a real person and people like that, you know, so I love what you're doing. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I actually couldn't do it without Cassandra, I have to say. So yeah, sure. She's, she's amazing. It's all you, Janae. It's all you, but I'm, I'm happy to participate. (laughs) No, no. (laughs) So what else can we discuss about hacking music maybe or jetpack? You know, I think, you know, talking about the sync school, talking about hacking music, I think, I think we've covered a good bit. I mean, it's, it's, you know, we're actually working in our business full time. And then we set aside a couple of hours a week Mm -hmm. for training. Um, so we're not like a lot of people who live on Instagram and who live on YouTube. It's like, we're actually running a business and then, oh, we, we also want to help and give back and strengthen artists and supervisors. So 90% of the time we're running our business and then we're able to carve out some hours for the sync school and for hacking music. So, um, I think that's a, a little bit of something that, that, you know, they're in in the thought leadership world. There's a lot of people who just sound smart and have never Mm -hmm. like worked on anything. Um, we're, we sound kind of smart and work on a lot of stuff. <laughs> I'll say that. <laughs> is is there anything, Cassandra, that any of your clients might be wondering? I guess, you know, it. I get asked all the time and I never really have a good answer. Um, the best way to go about submitting music for consideration for obviously it's not the not the ways that we just mentioned of you know randomly um sending an email blast with your soundcloud link but is there a good way to go about doing that yeah i mean i mean for us it's it's really about problem solving you know so if you can think about serving the supervisor and that's what music producers do they're serving they're helping the supervisor fix a problem So if you're able to voice that and say, Hey, what are some things that you're really struggling with? Or is there something I can help you with? A supervisor's response is going to be, somebody gets it right. They're not spamming me. They're asking that how they can help. So what, what I just said right there is like, if you can unpack that for your clients, you know, they will go to the top of the list. Yeah, that that's great. Cause, cause 300 people this week just went to the bottom of the list by saying, Oh, yo, here's my SoundCloud link. Check it right. out. And it's like, eh. right. You know what I mean? N- not interested in helping, not interested in understanding just transactional. Right. Right. So d- does that make sense? Yeah, it makes, it makes a lot of sense. Um, and that's, you know, I think a great way to think of it. So I'll be sure to pass that along. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Again, again, it's just people, people you want to work with, right? Tell me, sure. John, if this doesn't work this way yeah. for you, but again, the other supervisors I've talked to, they also appreciate it when you do your research. Um, so in other words, um, I'm working on this show and mostly it's heavy metal music mm-hmm. um, and I'm a hip hop artist and here's my music. Uh, I think it would be great for this, for this show to me. And, and it, it makes sense to me when they say this. Okay. Did you do any work at all? Did you do any research on yeah. what, what exactly we're looking for yeah. here? It's the same as spamming. Right. Or Janae, I think a, yeah. another way to approach that is like, okay, I know the show is about heavy metal, right? I do hip hop and here's a track that marries hip hop to heavy metal. I realize it may be an outlier for the show or it may be a breath of fresh air in context to the rest of the music. Just thinking about how I can help. Here's something to listen, you know, that you may want to check out all the best, you know, not expecting anything, but understanding, you know, everything isn't heavy metal, right? There has to be some back in the pedal off. Right. So if you understand the supervisor and understand their, their, pain points again you're bringing a solution to them and here's something that might be a breath of fresh air in the context of the rest of the show it's hip-hop plus heavy metal that's that's a way to to voice that in a way that is like oh yeah somebody's thinking with me 
You know what I mean? Yeah. Yes, and and they did their research yeah. because exactly the way you stated it was perfect. Like, okay, I know, you know, this is what this is about. However, right, right. I, yeah, I get that it's heavy metal, but if if you ever need a break from that or need something left of center, here's a, something that's a marriage between hip hop and heavy metal. You know, right. So see that that's a wonderful suggestion. Yeah. yeah. So, any other questions, Miss Cassandra? Or anything else that you want people to know, John? You know, Jetpack as a company is really built for the future for for artists who want to build a five and 15 and 10 year career. So that's kind of what gets us up in the morning. And that's what um, we look for in artists and writers and supervision projects. Um, It's about serving and strengthening artists and entrepreneurs. So, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's what we're about. Okay, great. And I, again, will put the links to everything in um, in the notes, and they'll also be up on the screen as well. Sure. And something too, Janae, that I think that maybe, maybe some of your listeners might like, um, we can create a, uh, like a special for your listeners. Um, I can send you that code. Oh, okay. Offline, but, um, you know, I, th- I think you're, you're, your show's great and your conversations are really like they're real conversations, intelligent conversations. So, um, so yeah, if that's helpful, we can, uh, we can send along a, uh, discount code. That, that would be fabulous. I think. What do you great. think, Cassandra? Yeah, that sounds great. Thanks, John. You bet. Yeah, guys. And any other questions, uh, feel free to reach out. Um, we're out here west of Nashville having a great time. Yay. So who knows? Maybe we'll do a follow up at some point. Yeah, um, absolutely. Like I said, we're going to be talking to Lexi um, actually next week. Good. Um, and um, oh, is there is there a, a sync school session coming up anytime soon? Yes, the sync school is coming up first week of October, October third through seventh. Okay. Yeah, it's going to be great. Try to get this up out there before then. And we we do this. A number of times each year so so there'll be some there'll be another another group coming up as well so okay great yeah great awesome janae thanks so much for the conversation i had a great time oh thank you for coming on and doing this with us we really appreciate it anytime my friend yes thanks so much john it was um very helpful lots of great information absolutely cassandra great to meet you as well you too talk to you soon guys